Welcome to the ITSP Magazine Podcast Network. You are about to listen to the Soulful CXO Podcast with Dr. Rebecca Wynn. These conversations focus on the intersection of technology, business, and humanity, exploring how these three areas impact each other. Dr. Wynn interviews guests, including business leaders, entrepreneurs, and experts in various fields to share insights and experiences on cybersecurity, risk management, and leadership. The podcast aims to provide a fresh perspective on how technology can be leveraged to create positive change in the world. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Welcome to the Soulful CXO. I'm your host, Dr. Rebecca Wynn. We are pleased to have us today, Teresa Devine. Teresa is the CEO of Teresa Devine Company and creator of 24-7 Purpose. She is well known as an accomplished CIO for Fortune 500 and private equity companies where she retired this year. She was recognized many times as a top CIO for helping large companies learn how to build their next generational digital business. Her main focus was on large enterprises and navigating the complexities of digital disruption to develop digital transformation security strategies. Today, She continues to work as a speaker, thought leader, board member, writer, coach, and leadership trainer. As a trainer and keynote speaker, she speaks from real-world executive leadership experience and provides proven methods to drive high performance and happy cultures. Her work has been featured on Oprah's Angel Network, Brains, Medium, Patheos, just to name a few. Teresa, it is so great seeing you again. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Dr. Rebecca. It's wonderful to be here. It's a privilege and an honor. So thank you for having me. I always find it fascinating how people got started in technology. And then for you, you moved all the way up to the ladder to go ahead and to be a CIO and CISO for advising top 500 companies. How did your journey start and how did you get to be CIO that you are? That certainly wasn't my plan, but through a couple of opportunities. I started out in the dot-com space, and that was over 20 years ago now. So I helped the company build their dot-com. And through that process, I realized that I had some project management skills. So I took on managing large software development teams, some offshore, some onshore. And that led to an incredible opportunity to be a CIO at a large uh, Fortune 500 company here in the uh, Georgia area. And from there, ended up going off on my own and becoming an interim CIO, helping mostly private equity companies go from distressed or just serious transformational type work helping them turn their IT department around, and ultimately helping them grow the business. So that's what I've been doing over the last 20 plus years and a little bit about the background of my career. It's been quite a journey. (laughs) So you recently retired. What led you to determine that you're going to retire and take another aspect of your career? That's a good question. And it's one that's taken a few years for me to finally retire for the last time. So I I admit that it took me three tries and I'm pretty confident that this will be the last time of of, of walking away from the career. My faith uh, in, uh, in Christ has led me to this new mission. And I believe that we serve lots of missions throughout our life and they don't have to be in ministry. They can be in the workplace and Most of my work obviously has always been in the workplace, in the corporate world, and I love that work. And I think that we are able to share our faith in ways that we are Christ-like individuals. We help people grow in their careers, and I certainly helped a few people do that. And I'm excited to be able to share that experience and help others succeed. I think that's the ultimate reward when we're working in the corporate world or anywhere in the working world. But what happened to me over many years, I've been a Christian believer since I was a child. So I've always believed, but I certainly haven't always been in God's will. So through that period of time and working in such a demanding career, I was always struggling and felt an anxiety around what am I doing to make a larger impact? What is my relationship to God? I wasn't a mature Christian for a few decades And so that took a while for me to get there. And through that experience, what led me to realize was that for me, I couldn't serve both the corporate high demand career job and also do the work that I believe that God is asking me to do now. So I think it's really important for Christians to understand that first and foremost, it's all about learning and growing our faith. 
and then making sure that we're aligned with God's true purpose, which we, many of us get messed up. I did for many years. And then once we're aligned with him and we really can discern what he's asking us to do in our lives, then that's the time to make decisions about what we're doing for work, what we're doing in our, with our hobbies, with, with you know, all of life and the way that we serve him, both. And, and for me, I've learned over the years that it's, it's everything, everybody in all circumstances. It's not a compartmentalization uh, of our faith, but it's weaving our, our understanding of God and being Christ-like with every individual and every situation that we encounter throughout our day. How did you go about doing that? Because that's the same concept, even if you are not a Christian or, or aren't serving Christ, mm-hmm. about trying to find out really what your, some people might call it, find your flow, find what is your internal calling, your internal peace, so then you can do the best in the world that you possibly can. How did you go about determining what that was? Yeah, that's a really insightful question. For me, it was years of floundering. And and I can only speak to being a believer. I I just don't have the knowledge to speak to uh, other faiths, of course. But And so I wouldn't possibly try to understand their point of view, but certainly respect that. And so for me, it was a, a, a process of understanding that I, I was somewhat tormented in my mind. Some of that was from past pain and hurts that needed to be healed by God. So that was a big part of it. But it was really understanding that what I lacked the most was the ignorance of his biblical word. And once that finally got through my thick head, then I started to learn and understand his word. And only through that could I understand what is his will truly? What are God's ways? And then from there, he leads us into that area of understanding, knowledge, confidence, clarity, right? And then we can start to hear and listen to the Holy Spirit in a more direct way so he can lead us. But before not understanding his ways through biblical understanding, really it was just floundering and just trying to figure things out on my own, which failed miserably. Yeah, I can hear you. I can hear you on that one. <laughs> so did you... I know some people use like diagrams. They look at where spirituality and physical well-being and mental well-being and how they intersect and then find that inner sanctum on on how to go ahead and find their true core self, I would say, or truly, is that what you had to do too? Or did you only go on a spiritual walk? Because I know for me, when with my physical health is not at its most optimum, then every other aspect of my life really falls apart. So did you find that you had to go not only on a spiritual journey, but you also had to go on a health journey and maybe on a mental journey and different areas like that as well, too? So you can go ahead and find out what your, as you would say, your true calling is? Yeah. And so just to, for my understanding and what I believe God shared with me, and then to, to answer your question, I tried to retire the first time and went to Africa. I have certainly done some things thinking that, oh, my purpose must be over there. And my air meeting, that's where I'm supposed to be serving. So I've taken, you know, trips to Africa, trips to, to Haiti. And certainly there's great work involved in doing that. But to answer your question, for me, it was coming to the realization, which is the basis for Christianity is full surrender me trying to figure it out on my own, not understanding biblical word, biblical truth, then I was constantly seeking something that was all about me. And that's the opposite of the the Christian life, right? We are to surrender to the Lord and life becomes all about serving him. And the glory in that uh, is one, we're serving for his glory, but we get all the benefits and all the adventure and all of the great rewards that come with that. Yes, to answer your question, certainly I was on many years of that type of searching, but really searching in the wrong places. However, of course, God is going to meet us where we are. So it was actually in Africa where he released to me and showed me through uh, some scripture and also a devotional that I received that serving him is everywhere. It didn't have to be in Africa. It can be if that's where he's asking that person to go and serve in a mission. 
but it's also right here in my neighborhood. And so I didn't understand that. I really thought that purpose was all about this big grand thing, this big event or this big contribution or legacy that I was supposed to leave behind. Very distorted view of what his purpose really is. And his purpose for believers is all about loving the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving others as we love ourselves. And that's found in Mark 12, 28 through 31. And that's what really revolutionized and gave me revelation uh, about that scripture that I'd heard many times, but I never understood. That is our ultimate purpose. It's not about doing things. It's about becoming Christ-like and being that way towards other people and ourselves. But to go back to your other point about health and well-being, and I believe all of these things are symptoms of areas in our life that may not be al- might not be aligned with God. Now, in some cases, there's just diseases that are completely out of people's control, and that doesn't mean that they're not aligned with God. I don't want to make that misunderstanding at all. But for me, it was many symptoms, and most of it was about um, dealing with past pain and, and healing that I needed to face with his help instead of on my own. And uh, through that process and understanding, uh, that was a big part. So I think it's, it is symptom-based as you described. Yeah. I think a lot of times we feel when we're feeling uncomfortable as human beings, it's because we're really not where we should absolutely be. And it might not be every aspect of your life, but as you have brought out, I think internally, we like to help other people. We like to be servant oriented. And one of the things that I tell when people are down and they're depressed and things aren't going right in their life, that I say, seek out a way to help somebody else, whether it might be even just helping them to the car with their groceries, whether it's they're walking by themselves, an older person, maybe they want someone to walk with them on that walk that day or something like that. When you serve other people in some aspect, it really feeds into you as a human and and people forget about that. And I think one of the reasons why a lot of us are getting burned out and stressed and things along those lines in our jobs is because we get so focused on career. And I've done this myself, I'm guilty myself that those other aspects of my life have been on the wayside. And and that's the one thing I think we see quite a bit today where people get out of balance. And when you get out of balance, you start feeling uncomfortable. But what we have to be careful about is that we lean into them working more. (laughs) (laughs) And we really should lean into looking at those other aspects of your life. I know you do a lot of coaching. Is that what you see too when people come to you for coaching and training that they're really out of balance in their life. And that's why they're struggling so much. Yes, uh, Rebecca, that's a great point. And that is the, 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 the two most common reasons that I hear people have this innate desire to mature their faith and to get closer to God was really more of the, the draw. Uh, but you hit on a great point before I get to that coaching question. One of the biggest symptoms that pushed me out of the the corporate life for good, and then certainly on the third try, was what you just spoke about. It was putting work first. Uh, I was a workaholic, crazy, insane hours to, and I just believed that's what I was supposed to do. And not because anyone was driving me to do that. Let's be clear, because there's a lot of bad rap, and you may agree or disagree with the corporate world, but I was never in a position where my my CEO was driving me to work that hard. He was the, the multiple that I had, they were always results driven, but they were typically sitting me down to say, you need to slow down. You're going to burn out. So I had some amazing mentors and, and leaders. So I just want to shout out to a little bit of positiveness around the corporate world. But anyway, my, my job took over. I, I don't have children, but I have an incredible, amazing husband of almost 30 years. And so the, the job took over and started to impact every relationship in my life. Uh, I never forget the one year that I forgot my mother's birthday. And that was just a big deal because I, I never did that. And that was one of many wake up calls that the next day when I realized I missed her birthday and I call her so sorry and so remorseful that this was a moment where this is off. This is way out of balance. 
And I, my personality and the type of work that I did, I just, I was not the type that could turn it off. So there's people like me out there and there's others who can do that. They can figure out how to create boundaries and how to set uh, certain parameters for their life. And I coach people on how to do that. So I'm never trying to get someone to leave the corporate world to go into ministry. And that's one of the myths about the work that I do. But you're right. They come to me, either they're burnout or they're just confused or they're a new Christian and they're just looking for guidance. Like, how do I get to the next level? I just don't feel like I know what I'm doing. I don't really understand this how to be aligned with the will of God. What does that even mean? These are all the questions that I had as a believer. And these are some of the things that I help people in, in the coaching and, and, and also help them understand that they're serving from God's strength as their foundation, but there are individual strengths that we all have. And I help them unleash those strengths and spiritual gifts so that they can be more impactful and serve the Lord with more energy and more joy. There should be a, a joyous experience and not a, a dreaded activity that so many of us get into because we just don't understand what it is and, and how it all works. I agree. I think one of the things that's easy to do as, as a human is we want people to be how we perceive them to be and not how they really are. And then we get into that relationship, working relationship, we're like, they're not the people we thought they were, but we weren't listening to who they are. And then we have trouble adapting to that. That's what I see quite a bit. That's one thing I tell people when you're interviewing with a company, don't allow them to only interview you. You really need to be interviewing them. Are they the type of people who resonate with you? Are they the type of people who are on the same path as you are? Because if not, you're really not going to be happy. And a lot of times we take a position because we need the paycheck. And my, I know that everyone has to pay their bills, things along those lines. I understand that. But the one thing is you have to ask eat beyond the paycheck, are you paying too high of a price? I know I've taken positions before in the past, a lot of times where what you were asking me was impossible to deliver regardless of the time and effort that I put in, there was just no way to, to meet that criteria. Mm -hmm. The price to pay was really too high. And it affected me physically for a long period of time after I left that engagement. I felt that in my gut. But I said yes, and went in. Yeah. You really have to listen to your gut and be willing to say no, because there was probably a an opportunity that was around the corner that was the better fit for me that I didn't take because of fear, uncertainty, and doubt. What happens if I don't take this engagement? Will it be a month or two months or maybe three months before I find a, a better consulting gig? Do you find that as well too on people not really listening to their inner voice to say a better yes to opportunities and be willing to say no to opportunities they really should be saying no to? Yeah, certainly. I've done that myself as well. And it doesn't take long, right, to figure out that, uh oh, <laughs> this might not be the best fit. And it, it could be both ways. So I've always been of the mindset and I completely uh, understand people that are in positions. I think about single moms and I think their decision making process is way different. Uh, than someone like me who doesn't have children to care for. So I think it's sometimes it's it's easy for us to say we, we probably shouldn't have done that. But maybe sometimes they're in a position where they just have to. And then hopefully from that that mistake or, or that setback, if you will, that will lead to something greater for them. But you're right. If that gut feeling is telling us don't do it. Don't do it. And you can't even explain why sometimes it could be the Lord protecting us away from that person experience, or he just has something better for us. He has a different door to open. So I think it's really tricky, but I think you're absolutely correct in that discernment. You had mentioned that when you were at work, you were all in, I was that way too. And you become so invested that one of the things is you don't realize that everybody around you is not as invested as you are. What words of wisdom would you give a person who's overly committed to work? They want to go ahead and be a little less invested, 
but they have the reputation on always being the go-to person. How do you start backing off from that to gain your resiliency back in the workplace? Ooh, that's an awesome question. It's one of those questions where I would say, okay, what would I tell my younger self <laughs> if I could go back? And the, the funny thing is, Dr. Rebecca, that I had all the most incredible support. So I'm not sure it, I could have done it. I, I, I don't want to discourage anyone from doing that. But my first piece of advice would be to go to your manager and explain to them what's going on and why maybe you don't even understand why you're doing what you're doing. There was a part of me that didn't quite understand it, but I, I love the addiction of performance. I love the addiction of seeing things improve and seeing the business happier. I loved when my team be, went from being discouraged and just beaten down pre previously to a happy, productive team that just wanted to contribute their best. So I, I really was addicted to all of those things. Obviously, my marriage was super important to me. So that was a big driver for me to realize I have got to get this, this balance back out. So I would go down the path of doing the boundaries and not staying in the office until eight o'clock. There was no reason for me to be there at that time and, and leave at a decent hour, things like that. But I think the best advice would be go to your manager. If your manager is not supportive, then I would say go to HR. Because if you don't want to leave the company, you love the company and you love your work, you shouldn't have to leave because there's a, a unrealistic expectation like the one you just described earlier. Go back to the manager and say, I would love to be able to produce this result. But in order for me to do that, we're going to either have to extend the deadline, we're going to have to adjust the budget, something needs to change. And I think when you go to people with uh, a problem, but you bring solutions and options I think it's a much better conversation than I'm just working too hard. <laughs> so I think it's it really is coming up with solutions around that and presenting that to the manager or that whoever the, the, the supervisor is. And if, if if you don't get support there, I, I do encourage people to go to HR. I would encourage my team members if I wasn't supporting them in the right way to go speak to HR. Um, I think that's important. I think people's mental health, obviously their families. And work life, I call it harmony, because I don't think balance is achievable uh, for most people. When you talk about true equal balance, I like the word harmony because I think it's less set up for failure kind of uh, word. <laughs> so I use harmony instead of balance. Yeah, I haven't known too many people who've had success in going to HR with those type of issues. If you're out there and you've had success, please leave me a comment. I'd love to hear the story of the success. I haven't heard too many of them. But going with why do we need additional time? What areas maybe do we need to cut and things along those lines definitely is a good thing. I would also say that if you're constantly being pushed to do sub-quality work, then maybe going ahead and having a discussion about what is a realistic win for the company? Are they just trying to make one more inch and you're trying to go ahead and get it all the way down to make a touchdown? Maybe it's your expectations of the project isn't aligned with their expectations on the project. And so maybe going ahead and having discussions on that way. If it is an unrealistic expectation on their part and there's no way to win, then maybe going ahead and having a committee meeting or something along those lines and seeing where everybody else is as a group if you have a very hard manager. When I'm talking about that way, it's the same thing as on the football field or something like that. When you have eight of you or 12 of you, whatever it is, depending on, on if it's soccer or if it's uh, American football, you're all trying to go one direction. It's a lot easier than you going solo. I think that's a big thing as well, too, that I've learned over a period of time. I'm trying to find those really good uh, people that you can line in the company with, that you have similar goals, that you can support each other goals versus it being us versus them. Is that something that, that you experience as well in your career? I know for me, especially if you work for startups, it can be us versus them. It's not always that everybody's trying to play well together because a lot of times that they're trying to basically look at me, we're great at expense of other people. And I think that the cost that's pretty high in startups. 
Yeah, I agree. I don't think I've been in a company that didn't have some level of us versus them. Whether it's the people on the front line, us versus the ivory tower C-suite. I think I've heard it all. (laughs) I, I do have a quick message to the leaders on this topic that you just mentioned, which is a lot of times in defense of the leader or the manager, we don't know that there's an issue. And a lot of times the team members are too afraid to bring the problem to the manager for whatever reason. There could be a legitimate reason. Maybe they were reprimanded. So now that, unfortunately, that has been established. So now they're like, I'm not going to go to the manager. I'm just going to get in trouble. (laughs) So I think that it's really important for leaders to ensure that their team members know that it's safe, that they're in a safe place, that they can come to me, open door, and let's sit down. And maybe it's just the two of us. Let's be professional about it and not bring these things up and you don't want to you don't want to surprise your managers or your leaders in a big group meeting. I think that's kind of leadership 101. But go to your manager privately or the project manager or whoever is in charge of this particular project that's causing so much long-term hours and, and things like that, or whatever the issue might be, and just go to them and talk to them. I think nine out of ten, you find that the leader doesn't have a clue and they're expecting the team to come to them with the problems, but maybe there's just a personality clash or a fear that's going on that they're just not willing to share. So I think it's a two-way street. I think people have to be mature and professional enough to take these problems to the right people and try to come up with solutions to work together. And many times someone would come to my office begrudgingly and say, you know what, I think we might have to push this deadline. And I'm like, let's talk about it. Let's see what that looks like. Let's see what we can do. And we have a conversation. But there was some fear I could see see it on their face <laughs> coming in the office. They didn't want to talk about extending deadlines because I was always a you know, driver of deadlines. I hope I answered your question there, but I wanted to touch on that other piece. I think that's critical. I think one thing is just what you said is that when people come to you and they're having a strong issue and they're trying to deliver, but they can't deliver for whatever reason, mm-hmm. you have to, as a leader, get out of the the driver of the issue to then coach, mentor, helper, facilitator on helping them with the solution. And I see a lot of leaders don't make that conversion. They're like, just go talk to this person. No, I literally am stuck. I am (laughs) stuck. I'm fear, uncertainty, and doubt, anxiety, and stuff like that. You then need to do the pat on the back. You need to make that change. And I see a lot of leaders don't know how to do that. Have you always done that in your career? Is that something that you had to acquire? Oh, I certainly had to learn a lot of leadership skills. I was not trained in in leadership early on. Uh, Obviously, again, I had some really great CEO mentors. But there are, all of us start out a certain way and we have certain character, personality types and, and, and character ways about us that have to be adjusted and changed. So I would say absolutely over the years, I just decided that I wanted to be better. I wanted to be a better leader. I wanted to be a better manager. So I invested in that training and I sought out ways to improve in in that. I'm by no stretch, (laughs) even close to being a perfect leader or mentor. But what I do find is that if you care about people, That's the number one criteria for a great leader is that you need to care. And if you don't care, they'll know and you can't fake it. It's definitely a learned and and practiced and intentional skill that we must acquire if we want to be good leaders and not just good leaders, but inspirational and motivating and supportive and empathetic and and all all those great things. Unfortunately, our time has totally run short. What is the best way for people to reach out to you for advisory services, for coaching, and learn how to be you know, better human beings and have better teams at work? Thank you, Dr. Rebecca. Yes, basically go to teresadevine.com. It's no H. And you can find out everything about what I'm doing there at the website. I do offer coaching to Christians who want to make a greater impact and who want to build out a spiritual growth plan. 
I am hoping to publish a novel in 2024, so stay tuned for that. And again, it's TeresaDevine.com. Teresa, thank you so much. You are a soulful CXO. Thank you. My pleasure. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Soulful CXO Podcast with Dr. Rebecca Wynn, part of the ITSP Magazine Podcast Network. If you learned something new and this conversation made you think, then add this show to your favorite podcast player. Subscribe to the ITSP Magazine YouTube channel and share the ITSP Magazine Podcast Network with your friends, family, and colleagues. If you represent a company and wish to connect your brand to our conversations and our audience, visit ITSPMagazine.com to learn how to sponsor one or more of our shows. We hope you will come back for more stories and follow us on our journey.